so glad you joined us this morning at Liberty. Let's go ahead and stand. We're going to worship him together today. When all I see is a battle, you see my victory. When all I see is the mountain, you see my mountain. And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. Come on, let's sing it out today.
Come on, church, we celebrate who he is. We praise the King of Kings. You may be seated for just a few moments. Once again, we'd like to welcome you this morning to Liberty. We are so excited, so thrilled that you chose to worship with us today. Uh, before we continue, if you are visiting for the first time this morning, you've been coming for a few weeks, you haven't really connected with us, uh, they're going to put a phone number on the screen for me. Uh, if you're in person or online, you can simply text the word info to that phone number. Uh, you'll get a, a link to a, an online form. If you'll fill that out for us, it'll make sure we have all of your contact information so we can keep you up to date and all the stuff that we're doing here at Liberty. Uh, you can also uh, go to the App Store and download the Liberty Church app as well. It has all kinds of good information. Uh, basically, it's a watered-down version of our website, but all the same information is there. Uh, you can uh, There's links uh, to sign up for different events. Uh, there's information about uh, volunteering, getting involved in small groups, all the different ministries that we have here. So make sure you do one of those two things. If you can't do that for some reason, in the seat pocket in front of you, there's a welcome card. If you'll simply fill it out for us, you can leave it in your seat as you leave, and one of our worship hosts will come and collect that. Uh, but we just, we strongly want to connect with you here at Liberty. Uh, make sure you uh, know everything that's coming out of our church, especially this summer. There's a lot going on still, even as we're getting close to the end of the summer and the beginning of the school year. If you noticed as you came in this morning, you probably uh, saw the back to school bash table. I uh, just want to take a few moments and uh, just challenge you guys. If you haven't yet, make sure you stop by that table on the way out today. Uh, find out how you can get involved with this year's back to school bash. A lot of people always ask us, you know, some tangible ways that it can, you know, just help us love in the community. This is a perfect way to do that. Uh, we simply provide backpacks with school supplies for school age children, as well as free haircuts. And, and I'm telling you, it seems so simple, but it really can make all the difference in the world, a simple act of love and kindness. And so we ask you, challenge you to partner with us in this event, find out how you can get involved, stop by that table. Uh, there's different volunteer positions, you can donate. Uh, if you can't do either one of those things, at least take some invite cards and uh, spread the news to the community about what we have here. We wanna make sure that those in need get the information. So even if you just know somebody or they know somebody uh, that could benefit from this event, make sure you grab some cards on your way out. But we thank you guys in advance. Uh, we know you guys are an incredible church and uh, we love to love in this community together. So uh, they're going to put the different ways that we uh, give here. Uh, if you are giving uh, in person today, you can uh, do one of those ways. Or as always, you can give through one of the generosity boxes in the commons area as well. Uh, for those of you online, you should be able to see the different ways that we give here. Uh, you can do it online by text, mail, drop off. Uh, we just try to make it as easy as possible for you guys to give this morning. But let's go ahead. We're going to bow forward a prayer, and then we'll continue to worship today. Dear Jesus, we're just so thankful for who you are today, God, and that we had this opportunity just to be able to come here and just to be able to worship you, just to put everything else out of our minds and just focus on you. And we ask, Lord, that you would just help us, Lord, just to never forget who you are. Lord, we believe that you are the King of kings, that you are the Lord of lords, and we ask as we just continue in this time of worship and later on we dive into your word, God, that you would just uh, move and work, that you would just continue to reveal to us your presence in this place, God. Lord, we love you so much and we just thank you so much for who you are. Again, it's in Jesus' precious name that we pray. Amen. Would you stand as we continue to worship today? sing these words out together today. We sing the Lord bless you. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give Sing Amen. Lord bless you 
so grateful again for who you are. Lord, we're so grateful over just your blessings, God, or that you pour out freely on your children. And we're so thankful, Lord, that we can celebrate your faithfulness in this place, God, that you will never leave us nor forsake us, God. And we ask, Lord, you would just always help us to remember who you are, that we can rest in your faithfulness and, and on your promises, Lord. 
We thank you so much for this time that we've had just to be able to lift you up. And Lord, now as we just come together in your word, Lord, again, just open our hearts to what you have in store for us today, Lord. Lord, we love you again. We thank you for who you are. It's in Jesus' precious name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Bobby. And good morning. What a joy it is to be back with you. I'm thankful to be asked back. That's wonderful just to be here. And I hope you've had a great, great week. Last week, we started on a journey together about moving forward and upward in the midst of change. Wow, we've been going through some change. But man, some of the change is really amazing, like what Clay talked with us about this last week how God has blessed this church so unexpectedly in unbelievable ways. And now the opportunity to move forward and to be a part of the legacy project and the next building phase and to do it and not go into debt for it. Boy, what an opportunity. What an opportunity for success. You know, success is an interesting thing. I was traveling way back before COVID, and I was in an airport in one of the major cities in our nation, and as I passed by a store where they sell magazines and all kinds of books, there were people gathered around a magazine rack, and there was a bunch of them, and they were buying the magazine, I thought, I want to see what that is, and I moved over, and I saw a U.S. News and World Report filling the whole rack, and on the front, was a graph, a graph like you're going to see on the screen. And uh, the difference was, as you see this graph going from the low to the high, from what was to what is really exploding now to become, there were people all along the graph as it climbed. Some were hanging on for dear life. Some were running up the hill. Some were just smiling. Some were in fear of dropping. And it was just captivating. And the title of that issue was this, success. How do you get it? Who has it? And how in the world do you keep it? I would later find out in a couple of weeks that that became the number one all-time seller of U.S. News and World Report. Why? Because everybody wants to succeed. That's why In fact, when I went to do an errand at the grocery store for Cheryl this week, I'm going through to check out, and I look up as I'm reaching for my billfold, this is what's on sale, a magazine that says success, and it just screams. Everybody wants to know, how do you find it? Once you get it, how do you keep it? Because everybody wants it in their marriage, their family, any organization, every church, And God says, be careful. Be careful when you think about success, what you interpret success to be. And especially be careful how you think you get it. Because the world will tell you one way to get it. But God says, my way is very, very different. We're going to see that this morning. If you have your Bibles, as we make this talk and walk through uh, Joshua, open it to chapter 1, verses 1 to 9. And if you have it on your actual Bible, or your webpage, or your smartphone, or your iPad, or whatever it is, turn to there because you want to be there so you can refer to it and then stand up in honor of God's word as we read it. They, the nation of Israel, were going also through change. God's called them to move forward and upward, and it says these words, beginning with verse 1. After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, who had been Moses' assistant. And he said, Moses, my servant, is dead, Joshua. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people, the Israelites, across the Jordan River into the land that I am giving to them. I promise you exactly what I promised to Moses. Wherever you set your foot, you'll be on land that I've already given to you. It will stretch from the Negev wilderness in the south all the way up to Lebanon mountains in the north, from the Euphrates River on the east to the Mediterranean Sea on the west. It will include all the land of the Hittites' overwhelming enemies. No one will be able to stand against you as long as you live, for I will be with you just like I was with Moses." I will not fail you, nor will I abandon you. 
Be strong and courageous, for you're the one who will lead these people to possess the land that I swore to their ancestors that I would give to them. Be strong, be courageous, and be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Don't deviate from them, turning either to the right or to the left, because then and then only you will be, listen to the word, successful in everything you do. Study the book and do it continually. Meditate on it day and night so that you can obey everything that's written in it. Only then will you prosper. And that has nothing to do with money. The word prosper means only then will you be able to make wise decisions. And only then will you succeed in all you do. This is my command. Be strong, be courageous. Don't be afraid or discouraged for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Heavenly Father, thank you for your promises in the word. Thank you that they're as true today as the day they were written. And Father, thank you that they are relevant in 2021 to what being successful in life is really all about. Now, I pray that you would speak through your word to us right where we are and that the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart would be acceptable to you in your sight. Oh, my rock and my redeemer. And I pray it in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. I want to encourage you when you think about the word success to be very careful of what you interpret it to mean. Because the world will tell you one thing, God's word tells you another. We're going to take a second and look at that. But remember Romans chapter 12, it says, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, don't be conformed any longer to this world. What it literally says is don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. Be careful what the world says to you about what success really is. For instance... There are three things that I hear over and over again and have heard all through my journey in living about success. Number one, well, I'll tell you what success is. Success is getting the right breaks. Really? Really? You know, that brings to mind to me a personality, a personality who had a nervous breakdown, who failed in business three times, who had some of his own personal family die unexpectedly who ran for offices, both public, private, and also local, state, and national. And he lost every one of them. But then he won, only to be killed. His name was Abraham Lincoln. Let me ask you a question. If you had gone to Abe and said, Abe, I mean, one of the greatest presidents of all time, do you think it was all because you got the right breaks? What do you think he would have said? Others say, it's not just about getting the right breaks. It's about being connected with the right what? People. It's not what you know, it's who you know. Oh, really? Edgewater Beach Hotel, Chicago, Illinois, 1923. America was beginning to shake on the foundations financially. Nine of the most powerful men in all of America when it came to finance and future planning met at that Edgewater Beach Hotel. Among the nine were the presidents of the largest gas company in America, the presidents of the largest electric company in America, the presidents of the New York Stock Exchange, the president of the Bank of International Settlement, a member of the president's cabinet. All nine got together and made the plans on how can America survive through this shaking time and be stronger in the future. (laughs) Boy, now that's a who's who and a what's what. And then 25 years later, someone wondered, what happened to those nine people who met together in the Edgewater Beach Hotel and were so connected? Uh, That's a good question. Let me tell you what happened. Of the nine, three died broke. One of them a fugitive from law. One of them died insane. Two of them spent time in prison. And three committed suicide. That's all nine. If you'd gone to them, would you have thought they would have said, Oh yeah, I'll tell you what success is. It's knowing the right people. I don't think so. The other thing I hear over and over again is 
if you really want to be successful, it's all about being in the right place at the right time. I remember when I lived in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and Cheryl and I were making our home there. I was traveling, speaking across the country. I was in Denver, Colorado. I had just spoken, and people were so gracious and responsive, and a guy came up to me, and he said, wow, you live in Fort Lauderdale, Florida? I said, yeah. He said, oh, man, palm trees swaying, gentle breezes, Atlantic Ocean, porpoises jumping. Man, if I lived in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, I'd be successful. I flew home to Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I was working the next day out in my yard, and Bill, next door, headed up the Exxon oil distributorship in all South Florida. Bob, where you been? Denver, Colorado. How's your week been, Bill? It's been absolutely pathetic. Denver, Colorado. Man, Bob, if I only lived in Denver. Do you see a problem here? You, you see, it's not about getting the right breaks, so though those can help, but that's not ultimately success. It's not about being connected with the right people. Relationships are good, and God always works through relationships, but it's not just about being connected with the right people, nor is about being in the right place at the right time. Here's what success is. Success is finding the will of God in the word of God and then doing it. That is success God's way. Finding the will of God in the word of God and then doing it. Last week I told you, all of us, all of us, as individuals, as couples, as families, as churches, as states, as countries, have the opportunity to make decisions. Once we make those decisions, it sets a direction. That direction will take us to very predictable destinations. Decisions set directions that lead to very predictable destinations. God says, you want the destination of a successful life? Then be sure you're finding my will in my word and then doing it. That's what will make you successful. Not only be careful about, oh, it's about being in the right place at the right time, being connected with the right people, or getting the right breaks. Be very careful about things that sound really good and Christian. Like, well, I'll tell you what, if God says it, and I believe it, that settles it. Now, that sounds pretty good and Christian, doesn't it? But it is so wrong. It is so wrong. Because here's the real truth. It is not. If God says it, and I believe it, that settles it. The truth is, if God says it, that settles it. It doesn't make any difference whether you believe it or not. If God says it, that settles it. And that does it. So therefore, am I going to take God at his word or the world and culture at its word? I asked you months ago when I was here one Sunday, what is the most unread book in America? Do you remember what so many responded? So many said, oh, it's the Bible. And I said, yeah, it's a great guess. Wrong answer, but it's a great guess. Because research shows that the most unread book in America is not the Bible. It is the vehicle owner's manual. <laughs> Remember that? Yeah. Let me just ask, how many of you here today have read at least a good portion of your vehicle owner's manual? Just let me sit, raise your hand high. Raise your hand high. Yeah. Okay, there are nine very sick people in a room. <laughs> Why? To, to, to know what does what. Okay, well, I used to work with major vehicle companies like GM and Ford and Chrysler. I learned something. There are two reasons why the vehicle owner's manual is written. Do you know what they are? So that the vehicle would operate at maximum effectiveness and avoid major breakdown. That's the only two reasons they write those. So they would operate at maximum effectiveness and avoid major breakdown. Here's my key question. When do you usually read your vehicle owner's manual? Uh-huh, uh-huh. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your owner's manual. God write, wrote this so that you and I could operate at maximum effectiveness and avoid major breakdown. Be careful about waiting till the breakdown to go to the owner's manual. God said, you want success? 
It is finding my will in my word and then doing it over and over again. He said to Joshua, oh, Joshua, be sure that you strive to do everything that is written in it. Don't turn to to the right or to the left. And then and then only will you be successful. He said, oh, Joshua, meditate in it day and night. Make sure you're in it and it's in you. And when that happens, Joshua, you'll prosper, make wise decisions in all you do. And I will bless your way. Wow. Success is not getting the right breaks. It is not knowing the right people. It is not being in the right place at the right time. It is learning God's will in God's word and then doing it. So what does he say about three things in this chapter about successfully moving forward and upward in the midst of change? He says, number one, success requires that you not camp in the past. Success requires that you not camp in the past. You see, all of us have the past. We have it as an individual. We have it as a family. We have it as a couple. We have it as a church. We have it as a nation. And it is there for a purpose. Hopefully, it has prepared us for the future. And in that past, there have been great joys and successes, but there have also been disappointments and heartaches. He said, here's the reality. Celebrate the victories and learn from the heartaches. And then move forward with expectation into the future. But whatever you do, don't camp in the past. Be it good or be it bad, just be thankful for it. Use it for the future. Oh, I wonder what Joshua thought about when he heard that. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now arise and take these people to the land that I have given them. That's what he's saying. You've had an amazing past and some heartache. Now learn from it, celebrate in it, and move forward to the future. I wonder if he thought about the power of prayer that he learned in that past. You see, in Exodus chapter 17, having come out of 400 years of Egyptian slavery, now Israel comes to the first battle they have with the Amalekites. You may remember the story. It was a fierce enemy, and the battle roared back and forth until finally God told Moses to go set up on a hill overlooking the battle. And as he had his hands up, representing praying to God for his presence and power, his blessing on his people, Israel prevailed. But when his hands began to lower, Israel began to lose. And suddenly, Aaron and Ur saw what was happening. They came in on each side of Moses, held his hands up so that Israel prevailed and conquered. It was a story and an object lesson that when you are in a battle... You can have all the resources you think possible. You can have all the strategies you think are important. But unless God's in it to give you victory, you're going to get defeated. So as a result, I wonder if he thought back and said, Wow, how important is the presence and the power of God in the midst of battles? By the way, just a warning. Go sometime in your own time to Psalm, or excuse me, to Exodus 32. There's a sobering story there. It says Moses had been up with God. He had been given the Ten Commandments. He came back down. The people had created a calf because he was gone so long. Now a golden calf that they had to worship. And as a result, God's anger grew. Moses was devastated. And suddenly, Moses hears God say, Moses Take these people that you led out of Egypt. Interesting point. Because up to that time, God has always said the people I led out of Egypt. Now, in view of the people's rebellion, in view of their turning their back on faith in God, he said, it's the people you led out, Moses. And he said, my angel will go before you. I will conquer those who resist you. But Moses, I will no longer be with you. Why do I even bring that up? Because the scariest thing I have about Christianity in America today is seeing people experience the provision of God without the presence and power of God. Let me say it again, the provision of God without the presence and power of God. 
He said, Moses, I'll still go before you in the form of an angel who will lead you. I'll even give you victory over those who will resist you. But Moses, what has made you what you are has been my presence and my power in you. That one is gone. And Moses realized what was at stake, fell on his knees and begged God until God restored his presence and his power. I wonder if all that are things that came to Joshua's mind. Boy, the power of God, the presence of God is so much more important than just the provision of God and calling on God in the midst of the battle, as we sang this morning, is all about how to successfully deal with the battles I'm going to face. I wonder if he thought about the necessity of waiting on God. Do you remember when Moses went up into the mountain for 40 days? Halfway up, he turned to Joshua and said, you stay here. I'll be back. I wonder what happened five or six days later. I wonder if Joshua got antsy and thought, what's the deal? I wonder what happened when it was 10 or 15 or 20 or 30. It would be 40 days until Moses would come back. I want to ask you a question. How many of you have ever spent some time in a waiting room in a hospital? Have you agreed that it's one of the toughest places in all the world to be? In a waiting room of life where you know you can't fix it, where you know you can't solve it, and you know you can't handle it. It's beyond you. That's where Joshua was for 40 days. Liberty, God's going to have you in a waiting room. Waiting to your next leader. Don't waste this waiting room. Understand God's got some things for you in the waiting room of life. In Psalm 27, verse 14, it says, Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. And in Psalm 103, verse, or excuse me, Psalm 130 and verse 5, I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits, and in his word I place my hope. Was it the need to wait on God that he remembered? Remember, as you walked with Chris, as you walked with Amy, in the years they were your pastor and first lady, remember some of the things that you learned, how you grew, insights you gained, victories you experienced? Oh, remember those. Hold to the victories. Learn from the challenges, but don't camp there. Move forward into the future of what God has for you next. In Philippians chapter 3, Paul says it well. He says, look, I want to experience the power, the energy, the strength that raised Jesus Christ himself from the dead, beginning with verse 10. But I want you to also know I have not attained that. I am still striving to get to that. But I want you to know this. As I press forward to the future, there is one thing I do. I forget the past. Whether it's its victories or its challenges, that's not where I camp, he said. And instead, I look forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God through Christ has called me. Oh, cherish that past. Be thankful that past. Learn from that past. Celebrate that past. But don't camp there. Move forward. Not only do you not camp in the past, number two, success requires that you stand on the word of God in the present. You stand on the word of God in the present. In Exodus chapter 17, verse 14, we find the first beginning of the word of God. God said to Moses, take what I have said to you and put it on a scroll. Put it in the book and then regularly read it to Joshua. From that moment on, the word of God became the message of God for how to successful live for God. Interesting. We all would say, I believe that. I think that's right. I couldn't agree more. But listen to this. George Barna did a study 
of church attenders in America. He asked them the question, how important do you think it is to regularly be in the Word of God as a proclaimed follower of God? 75% of those surveyed nationwide said it's very important to be regularly daily in the Word of God. Then he asked this question, how often are you in the Word of God? And he found that only 13% spent any time at all daily in the book. Oh, Joshua, I tell you, get in the book and get the book into you. Don't deviate it to the right or to the left. For then and then only will you be successful in all you do. Meditate on it day and night. For then and only then will you prosper, that is decide wisely, and be successful. Wow. How often are you in the book? How well do you know the book? You see, God will teach us all lessons about the book in some very interesting ways. How many of you like fishing? Let me just see. Men or women? Yeah. How many of you who love fishing know the name Jimmy Houston? Let me just see. Jimmy is the longest uh, term bass pro fisherman and most successful in all of America. 42 years he has been on TV every single week. He absolutely fills a room with joy and gregarious outgoing personality. He is a hoot and a great friend. I was with him and we were speaking together in an event a couple of years ago. I never will forget this. And while we were just having some time to ourselves, I said, Jimmy, what's the greatest thing that's happened to you just recently? He looked at me and said, well, I guess the best thing just recently is I just finished reading the Bible through again. Again. Jimmy, what do you mean by again? He said, well, it's 50 times now. 50 times. I said, Jimmy, how in the world did you start reading the Bible through and do it 50 times? You see, while I'm thinking that, I'm thinking, I hope he doesn't ask me. <laughs> you ever been there? You ever thought those kind of things? Because you see, it's one thing to say, oh, I believe in the book. It's a whole nother thing to be in the book. They are vastly different. Here's what he told me. He said, Chris and I had just been married just a short while and it came to Christmas. We were opening presents and I opened one and there it was. It was a read the Bible through in a year book. I figured she thought I needed it. <laughs> so I read it. Fast forward a year later, Christmas happened again. We're opening our presents, and I came to one, opened it. It was another read through the Bible in the book. She must have thought it didn't work the first time. <laughs> but it was a different translation, so I read it again. He said, I've never stopped since. And I'm thinking, how many times I've heard somebody talk about that or say that or challenge me to do that, and I thought, I'm too busy. I don't have the time. Too many things happening too many places to go, too many responsibilities with which to deal. And then I thought about Jimmy, who owns a production company, who has a weekly television show, who's at every Cabela's and Brass Pro event in America that's of any major consequence, who constantly is speaking and doing public appearances. And if that guy can read the word every single day for 50 years, record what is your excuse? And I remembered something somebody told me a long number of years ago. They told me, Bob, don't ever forget. An excuse is nothing more, nothing less than a skin of a reason stuffed with a lie. It's a skin of a reason stuffed with a lie. I'm too busy. I don't have time. There's too much to do. I couldn't do that. I don't read well. Whatever it is. Why is it important? In Psalm chapter 19, he tells us very quickly. Let me just read it to you. And if you've got your pad, your Bible, your iPhone, just turn. Psalm 19, verse 7, because you want to mark this. Here's why God says 
It's so important to be in his word every single day. The instructions of the Lord are perfect. That word means they can't be improved on. They are perfect. And they revive the soul. The word revive means like to restore an old car or piece of furniture. It means to make it like new. They restore me and make me new from the inside out. The decrees of the Lord are trustworthy. That it means you can take them to the bank. And in a world in which people are dying to find things they can actually trust in, God says, here it is. It is trustworthy. You can take my word to the bank. If I say it, that settles it. They make wise the simple. It means they give me wisdom to make decisions that are not just good but are wise. The commandments of the Lord are right. That means they're absolutely correct. And they bring joy to the heart. When I read them and follow them, they bring joy inside of me. The commands of the Lord are clear and they give insight to the living. That means when I'm facing a challenge, they give me God's perspective rather than just man's. And they help me make wise decisions. Reverence for the Lord is pure. It lasts forever. And the laws of the Lord, they are true. And each one is fair. They're fair. They're for your best interest. Therefore, let them be more desirable than gold, even the finest gold, sweeter than honey, even honey that drips from the cone, because in the words of God, there is warning, and in obeying them, there is great reward. Wow. Don't camp in the past. Stand firmly on the word of God in the present. And be sure that you meditate on him day and night. You know what meditate means? It means like a cow does to chew the grass, digest it, I'm sorry, and then bring it back up. And then chew it again. And then bring it back up. I mean, come on, we're country folks, okay? That's what it means. It means take the word and get it in you and let it just come up and back and forth inside your life. Another way you can translate that is let yourselves hum in it. Huh? That's what the Hebrew can also mean. Hum in it. How many of you have ever been around somebody who sang song over and over again until you wanted to knock them out? Let me just see. Yeah. I was on a trip with a friend of mine, seven hour trip in a car. And this guy loves Elvis. From the time we left to the time we arrived, that idiot sang Elvis songs every single mile of the journey. I was about ready to take him out until that night when I did take him out because over and over again in the middle of the night, I would wake up with a stupid Elvis song in my mind as though I were humming it over and over and over again. That's what he says. Let it get in you so much that you can't get it out of you. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, even when you're asleep, God's word is working in you. Keep it in mind so that it can be on your tongue when you need it most, and then you'll be successful in all you do. Don't camp in the past. Stand firm on the word in the present. And lastly, he says success requires that you walk into the future holding tightly the promises of God. That you walk into the future trusting and holding tightly the promises of God. You see, the man who wrote this book, all God Almighty, is the God who never has broken one promise given in it yet. Never one. Everything he's promised, he's made come true. If you fast forward in the book of Joshua, at the end of his life, Joshua says two things I want to leave with you today. In Joshua 21, verse 45, he says, Not one of the good promises which the Lord had made to the house of Israel ever failed. All came to pass. Again in Joshua 23, verse 1. Joshua's dying. And the last words of somebody dying are pretty significant words. They don't waste breath. 
They really focus on what's important. Listen to what he says in his last breath. Now behold, today, I'm going the way of all the earth. In other words, I'm returning to dust. From dust I'm made to dust I return, the Bible says. And you know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one word of all the good words which the Lord your God spoke concerning you has ever failed. All have been fulfilled to you. Not one of them has failed you at all. God says... If I say it in my book, you can count on it in your life. If I say it, that settles it. It's amazing how God brings it back to memory. As I was preparing this message this week, I was in the Word of God on Wednesday. Listen to what I came to in Isaiah chapter 34, verse 16. There it was. It said, And the Lord has promised this to you, and His Spirit will make it all come to pass. Wow, what a God. I mean, I'm preparing, I'm working, he's speaking, and he just puts his stamp on it to say, just in case you were wondering, I got it right here. Amazing thing about the promises of God. Let me just make two comments, and I'll finish. When it comes to the promises of God for your life and mine in this book, they are never altered by time And they're never affected by circumstances. When it comes to the promises of God, they're never altered by time. You see, it's 500 years before that God promised the promised land to Abraham. Now, 500 years later, Joshua is leading the people in. They were never altered by time. Nor were his promises ever affected by circumstances. In Exodus chapter 14, God had released Israel from 400 years of slavery in Egypt. They had gotten free. God had not only done that, but he had given them everything they ever needed by the Egyptians, giving them gold and silver and clothing. It says in the scripture that in the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, never once did their sandals wear out. But now they're facing the Red Sea on the front. Egypt has said, well, that's our greatest slave force, and sent their army to bring them back home to the south as desert, to the north, Egyptian uh, fortifications. And the people began to grumble and complain, as I mentioned last week. And Moses says, God, what do we do now? God says the most interesting thing regarding his promise. He says, Moses, stand firm and watch the deliverance of the Lord. For the army you see closing in behind you today, you'll never see again. And history shows that the entire Egyptian army was devastated, drowned, and destroyed when God parted the Red Sea and then made it collapse when the Egyptians came through and Israel was already safe on the other side. Stand still and watch the deliverance of the Lord. For the Lord your God today will deliver you and the army you see behind you, you'll never see again. And immediately in the next verse, it says in Exodus 14, so move forward and take these people into the land. I got a question for you. How do you stand still and move forward at the same time? That's exactly what God said. But how do you do that? It's really important you understand this. What he's saying is stand firm, Moses. Planted on my word, And trusting it with all your heart. And as you stand firm on my word. And trusting it with all your heart in the present. Now move forward into the future. And know that my promise is as good as done. That's exactly what God did. Oh, liberty. As you make this transition. As you move through times of change. God saying to you, stand firm in my word. And then move forward, counting on what I promise to you will be exactly what I do for you. Success. It's not what the world says it is. It's what God says it is. And that is finding his will in his word and then doing it. 
So I want to end today with giving you a challenge. I'm calling it the Success God's Way Challenge. The Success God's Way Challenge. I've talked to the leadership here in the church, and everyone, 100% said, let's do this. I want to challenge you to do something maybe you've done before but haven't done in a while, maybe you've never done. And that is read through the Word of God with me and Cheryl starting on September the 1st. I've worked with Walk Through the Bible, and they have agreed to give us an amazing price on a Bible that takes you through the Word of God that's divided day by day in the calendar year. Each day with a few chapters started with a one-page devotion that applies what you're about to read to the life you're called to live. It is outstanding. And we're going to start it, whoever wants to, and make the journey of success God's way challenge to do this together starting September 1. That means we'll just get this together. We'll go to September 1, and on September 1, we'll all read it that day, and the next day, and the next day. You'll be amazed at what you will be experiencing in life as a person, as a family, and as a church, and how God will speak to it in amazing ways as you make the journey to be together. But it's up to you. You make the call. If you want to join that challenge, then today, before you leave, stop by the bookstore. All they need from you is a name, an email, and a preferred telephone number. And by the 12th of August, we're going to order these books for everybody who ordered them. They're only going to be $15. That covers the book. That covers the shipping. That covers every expense. And every one of us will join together in preparing for what God has in store for us in the future as we spend time in his word in the present to get us ready for what he's made possible in the next days. The choice is yours. And if you're with us online and you live in the Dublin area, you can do it too. Just let us know by text or by email that you want to be a part of the challenge for Success God's Way and the Bible reading book for one year. We'd love to have you join us. Let's make a difference. And let's prepare now for the man God's got for us in the future by being ready spiritually when he steps onto this ground. Would you bow your head? With your heads bowed, your eyes closed, your hearts quiet. I wonder, across this place, boy, we had so many in the early service. How many of you would say, Bob, I'd be willing to join that challenge of success God's way and read with you and with the leadership of the church and with Cheryl through the Bible in this next year starting September 1. I may stumble a bit. I may get behind once in a while. But I want this kind of discipline in my journey because success I get is finding the will of God in the Word of God and then doing it with heads bowed, eyes closed, hearts quiet. If you'd be willing to prayerfully consider making that journey with us, would you just raise a hand? I'm willing to do that. I'm open to making that journey. I'm willing to get in the Word of God and getting the Word of God into me. Thanks so much. And if you're joining us online, I hope you have just settled that in your heart. For those of you who are here, I ask you to please, before you leave today, stop by the bookstore and say you want to be a part of the challenge of reading through the scripture in a year. But maybe you're here today and you're not even sure about the one who wrote the scripture. You've been struggling, you've been thinking, you've been considering, but you haven't made the decision yet. And there's not a time and a specific place where you can point to where you know that you know that you know that you settled your relationship with Jesus Christ once and for all. Today you can do that. Today you could say, Lord Jesus, I need you. I invite you into my heart as Savior, and I ask that you forgive my past. But I also invite you to be Lord and ask that you would direct my future. And I thank you for loving me where I am, but loving me too much to let me stay there. 
and I surrender my life to you. Whether you're online or whether you're here in the facility, God can change your heart in a heartbeat. He can give you a brand new beginning and everything old can be passed away. Everything the scripture says becomes brand new. And that's the assurance you can have. God said, whosoever calls on me shall be saved and transformed. But maybe you've been looking for a group of people who would walk with you through this life and the challenges of it. There's not a greater place I know or a greater group I've found than Liberty Church right here. Today, you can become a part of that family. We'd love to have you join us. Well, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for speaking to us through your word. Thank you that it's alive and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. And I just want to thank you for what you want to do in us so that you can change the world through us. And I thank you for everybody here and joining us online this day. Father, may you bless their life and may you transform their future. I pray that in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Let me just ask you to look at me just for a minute. I want to say two things in closing. If you're here and in this place, in the front of that uh, chair in front of you, on the back of it, is a thing called the welcome card that Bobby referred to earlier. If you're here and a visitor, please let us know that you're here. We want to get to know you. We thank God for you. And then if you made any kind of decision today, would you just take a moment and on the back side say, yeah, I, I nailed it down. I settled it with Christ today. Would you let us know that? Because it's not just about a decision. It's about a changed life. And we want to help you know what the next steps are. Or maybe you want to belong and be a part of this family and you know, as I do, there's something different here then say, I, I want to belong. I, I want to know more about being here. We would love to have it. You can just lay it on your chair. But if you would love to talk with somebody or ask some questions, or if there's something going on in your life that you would love somebody to pray for you about, right after we're done, there will be worship hosts right here. You can bring this card to them, or you can just come up and say, I've got a question. Can I ask you a second? Or I'm challenged with something I'm dealing with. Would you just pray for me? It'll be totally confidential. We would be honored. And we would be thrilled to pray for you. Give us that joy and give us that opportunity. I want to just tell you a neat thing as I close. I did the first service. I walked out talking to a lot of people. And a guy came up to me and he said, you're not going to believe this. He said, when you were talking about getting in the word, I knew I needed to be better at that. When you talked about doing it through a year and, and having a book to do it in, a Bible that you go through daily, I thought, I'm going to do that, and I'm going to do that for my wife and me, but we're going to do it on our anniversary. And then when you said, we'll start September 1, guess when my anniversary is? <laughs> September 1. He said, we're going to be a part of that, and oh, by the way, this is my cousin, who's been going through a really tough time. It's the first time she's ever been to this church. After we were done, she said, I'll be back. I'll be back with my kids. There's something different about this place. Listen to me. There are neighbors and friends and work associates and relatives that you know that have never been in this place, but they need to be. And research has shown nationwide that the vast majority of people who don't go to church say, I'd go, but nobody ever invites me. Then think about that neighbor, relative, work associate, friend, who maybe this week you'll ask to come and be with you. Bobby, come and you and Clay close us out. God's blessing to you and thank you. Wasn't that a great word this morning? 
But I do want to encourage you one more time. If, if you did make a decision this morning, we want to celebrate with you. We want to pray for you. I encourage you to come forward, or you can uh, simply text that, that word trust, that phone number. But we spent a lot of time creating a resource here that we call Next. Uh, it is a fantastic resource as you begin your lifelong relationship with Jesus. And so we want to make sure that we get that into your hands and celebrate with you. So if you did make a decision this morning, uh, make sure you come forward. Let us know in some way, and we would love to pray with you and get that into your hands today. But Clay's going to come out. Uh, b- before he uh, closes us out, though, uh, just one more time, want to make a plea for you guys, a challenge for you guys to stop by that back to school bash table. Uh, make sure you get involved in some way. I'm telling you, this is such an incredible way to just show love to this community. Uh, you know, st- stuff like the back to school bash is so near and dear to my heart. As a child, I benefited greatly from programs like that. And so I know that something as simple as even a backpack can help change and mold a life. So make sure you get involved. Stop by. At least pick up some invite cards and get the word out to our community for us. I'm going to turn it over to Clay. He's going to uh, dismiss us, and then we'll be uh, out of here. Good morning, church. Oh, come on now. You about like the first service. Let's try it again. Good morning. That's ten times better. Thank you. But hey, just wanted to take a minute and remind you of the of the really good news that we heard last week about how God had been just tremendously uh, blessing this church financially. I told you last week that there would be, uh, beginning this week and then the next three consecutive Sundays, an opportunity for you to give to Legacy uh, towards the building project. And, and that's exactly what's been made available to you. So you can either do that online, two different ways, online. Uh, if you do that, just choose the drop-down box that says Legacy so it, it gets to the right place. Uh, or you can do it here this morning in person again or the next three weeks. Um, as you leave out uh, in the foyer area, you'll see a table and, and a chest sitting on it with a sign beside it that says Legacy. Again, if you're, if you're writing a check this morning, dropping it off in there, just make sure uh, that, you, that you mention Legacy on the check as well. Uh, really exciting about where we're at. I, I was thinking about it this morning, uh, just looking at, at the total figure and where we've got to go. We're over 60% of, of the way already. Uh, so that's really exciting about how God has kind of teed it up and see where we'll go. Hey, let's say a word of prayer and then we'll dismiss, okay? Father, we just thank you so much for today. And God, we, we thank you for the word that we've heard this morning. What a stark reminder of how we need to be in your scripture, in your word every single day. And God, not just to read it, not just to hear it, but to do it, to live it out, to flesh it out every single day. And, and God, your, your word says that we, we're not going to be in your will unless we're in your word. And Lord, just help us on a daily basis to have that hunger to do exactly that. And God, I just thank you for those who've come today, those who are online. And God, we just ask your protection over them, uh, Lord, as they go out and they do life every single day. Again, thank you for your word. And more than anything, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, church. You're dismissed.